Shripat, can we start? Yes, yes. Okay. So, because I think uh, slowly people may tickle in. So, it's okay. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, let us start uh, the last lecture of March uh, on math cleaning. I am happy to welcome uh, Professor Shripat Garge uh, <clears throat> on this platform. Uh, Shripad did his basic uh, study of mathematics from Pune University and then he joined uh, Harish Chandra Research Institute, um, popularly known as HRI Prayagraj for his PhD. Uh, he worked under the guidance of Professor Dipendra Prasad for his doctorate on linear algebraic groups. After his doctorate, he worked at uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. University of Paris and Elfeld uh, University for postdoctoral work. Then he joined IIT Bombay um, as a faculty member. At IIT Bombay, he leads a group of uh, doctoral students, postdocs, and uh, talented uh, UG students uh, around group theory. Uh, he is one of the few mathematicians who is also interested in math education and um, I was, when I was at IIT, I was happy to interact with him uh, on some topics in math education. That was a pleasure. Uh, he is a member of uh, several boards of studies of the colleges in Mumbai, and also has been a part of some NCRT committees on mathematics education. So with this short introduction, I welcome Shripad uh, to talk about uh, my uh, mentor uh, in Mumbai University, who was the person who brought me to mathematics, essentially, Professor, oh. Professor S.S. Shrikande. I think it's a time to say that uh, uh, for my MSc uh, entrance test interview, he was there as HOD. And for, okay. my, for my research scholars interview at Mumbai University, also he was uh, uh, in that committee. And he was the one who sort of uh, encouraged me to join uh, so uh, let me, uh, with those kind words for his soul, let me uh, ask uh, Shripat to start his talk on the century of a mathematician, Professor Shri Kande. Please. Thank you very much, Professor Anna. It's a pleasure being here. I see that several excellent mathematicians have given talks on uh, this forum, and it's nice to be part of such a uh, nice list. Um, I did not know about your connection with Professor Shrikhande. I actually didn't know anything about your connection with Mumbai University. But yeah, <laughs> being, uh, it's very it's a nice coincidence. Good to know that. Okay, so let me begin. Uh, it's about the century of an Indian mathematician. I hope you can all see the slides. Uh, you know, in life or anywhere in mathematics, in life or uh, in society, in nature, round things you know every if something is rounded up that's that has some value so for instance you know if somebody is out on 99 in cricket then we don't feel that uh, nice about it uh, as compared to if the person has got 100 or maybe one or two more so the century is something which is much better because it's a rounded up thing you know for instance if you uh, know anything about uh, cricket of my time like Muhammad Azaruddin and so on, then you may know that Muhammad Azaruddin's highest test score is 199. It's not, uh, so he doesn't have a double century to his name. And century is something which is, uh, you know, rounding up, it's a nice number. So it's in particular a pleasure when uh, somebody whom we look up to completes a century. And so I was very happy when Professor uh, S.H. Shrikhande completed century and uh, then there was uh, some small... Uh, you know, uh, in mathematical community, in mathematicians community, there was some discussion about it and so on. So let me begin with uh, telling us something in short about uh, Professor Shrikhande. So Sharat Chandra Shankar Shrikhande, that's his full name. And uh, to describe in one sentence, uh, something that is there in Wikipedia also. He uh, was, unfortunately, he is no more. So he was an Indian mathematician whose career was very distinguished 
and uh, his well recognized achievements took part mostly in the subject of combinatorial mathematics so that's the part he worked in and uh, to tell very briefly about his uh, background he came from a very humble background so you know i was uh, reading about some of the articles which were written uh, on his uh, centenary and also some uh, obituary articles and we uh, i was surprised to see that his father worked at a flour mill meaning you know in marathi or hindi we call it chakki wala so his father was a chakki wala in uh, a small place in madhya pradesh and professor srikhande had to earn scholarships to continue his education and uh, he completed his education throughout i think his schooling and college time he secured uh, scholarships so he was uh, at uh, this uh, government college of science in nagpur now this is known as the institute of science and now there are i think uh, two three other institutes also there is one in mumbai and one maybe in uh, aurangabad so this is where he studied he did his bsc with on- honors and he got first rank and he got a gold medal meaning uh, you know typically people who are good they cannot be kept down and i think professor shrikhande is an excellent example of uh, this phenomenon so um, in fact uh, after completing his bsc since he was not studying anymore there was no scope of getting a scholarship and he wrote in his own uh, uh, biographical article that he was looking desperately for some way to earn money so he was doing some small teaching job jobs here and there and then he read a small advertisement of uh, indian statistical institute and it was an advertisement for the post of statistical assistant so he went to isi kolkata and he was selected as the statistical assistant and uh, which really meant that he had to work with professors there and help them in their research so luckily you know when things have to happen in a nice way they do happen so professor r c bos raj chandra bos he joined the institute around the same time and shrikhande started working with him that was one very good turn of fortune for uh, professor shrikhande and also actually for professor bos then um, after working there in the isi kolkata for a few years professor r c bos went to united states of america to take up a job uh, in the university of north carolina and uh, so professor shrikhande also uh, went not immediately but uh, after a while because he had to again you know get funding and all those things he went to university of north carolina and worked there with professor bos completed his phd there at uh, unc and then he returned to nagpur he wanted to come back to india he did some teaching stints some you know what we call post doctoral positions uh, in the uh, current lingo so he returned to nagpur to the same college the institute of science which was then called the government college of science and took up teaching but he kept visiting professor bos uh, meanwhile and uh, he visited him in 1959 and that's when they worked on the disproof of euler's conjecture so i'm going to explain uh, this euler's conjecture to you in a short while uh, but this is where meaning this was right after he completed his phd um, took up a job in nagpur and then he went back and visited professor bos and they did in fact they had planned to work on this and uh, they did complete that work and uh, that's what made them all very famous so when he returned after uh, uh, working on this to india he took up initially a job in banaras hindu university and then he was invited to found the mathematics department uh, at mumbai university which was then known as bombay university so he was the founding head of that department and he worked there all his uh, active uh, life uh, until his retirement he was there so you know he was born in uh, 1917 i told you and then 1978 so he was 60 years old 60 or 61 when he retired and at that time you know typically at around 60 years uh, of age people look at you know retiring and leading a good life and with uh, you know being with children grandchildren and so on and that was when he was he was offered this directorship of the harishchandra research institute 
So in fact, in my uh, introduction, Professor Rana said that I did my PhD at HRI. Then it was known as MRI. So M stands for Mehta. There was a Jute industrialist from Kolkata, and uh, he sponsored this research institute in Prayagraj. And uh, when Professor Shrikhande went there as the director, it was a private research institute. And in fact, during his tenure. the mri was recognized as a dai research institute so you know we can understand how long the process will go the government has to come see various things and there are several things that need to be fulfilled and so on and uh, it was finally complete under his tenure under the tenure of professor shrikhande and then mri became a, a government research institute the campus was allocated and the institute started taking shape um uh, but professor shrikhande again uh, you know after working there for several years he returned came back to maharashtra and professor uh, hs mani then uh, took up the uh, directorship of hri and he oversaw the institute you know being built in the campus and so on so uh, until the 90s early 90s he worked there and then he returned to nagpur uh just to tell you in brief he was a fellow of the insa the indian national science academy the indian academy of sciences which is uh, based in bengaluru and also the institute of mathematical science uh, mathematical statistics united states of america so there is also a documentary on him uh, which was produced by dr arun mukti bodh who, who is a retired head of the uh, one of the colleges in nagpur and it's titled as oilers spoiler a living legend this is available on youtube free of charge so i would really suggest that you go and uh, take a look at this documentary it's a long documentary but it gives all the details about uh, professor srikant okay so this was about his biography and now i would like to move to the mathography i don't know if you have heard this word before uh, mathography i came to know about this first when i read uh, halmos's book so paul halmos uh, an american mathematician he wrote uh, a book and uh, the title of the book was something and then there was a subtitle second title that was an automathography and uh, since the mathography was not very well known that time he explained it what he means by this and he said that it was his life to do with mathematics so he wanted to basically talk about his mathematical experiences so we are going to talk about uh, professor shrikhande's mathematics in this very short uh, discussion so just uh, to give you an idea his research contributions had a tremendous impact on the development of combinatorics in the second half of the last century so you know he worked in 1959 that's when he did his monumental work and then on there was a spurt of uh, work in the design theory that's part of the combinatorics uh, which uh, were, where professor shrikhande worked quite a lot and uh, his research had a great impact on uh, that work so his specialty was uh, combinatorics and especially statistical designs uh, shrikhande graphs there are some graphs which are named after him they are used in statistical designs you know meaning one has to really do some good work so that there is some term which is named after uh, you and uh, that tells about his impact and uh, to read from one of the articles which are uh, written on professor shrikhande there is a pattern which is distinctly visible in his work the pattern is that his effort has been in the combinatorial designs and related topics several times he developed path breaking techniques generating a lot of activity in the field to tell you about this you know whenever um, there is a field of mathematics whenever there is an area of mathematics where people are actively working all of them are working around similar themes and uh, if there is any easy result if there is something which can be easily observed then these experts are sure to spot it very soon so if there is something which is standing open for a long time if something which is not understood for a very long time then it is uh, more likely that uh, some different techniques will be needed to solve that 
and professor shrikhande was especially an expert in getting new techniques to solve problems so he would bring these techniques generate a lot of activity in the field and then him himself would continue to pursue them and apply them to any new structure he studied so this is the pattern which was uh, which is very visible in uh, professor shrikhande's work and uh, often he successfully used these new techniques to solve well known problems so the his specialty was essentially to attack and uh, solve the problems which have been uh, not understood by, for a very long time that's what uh, he used to do uh, so this talks about his impact again on uh, the combinatorial uh, mathematics it is believed this is from one of the obituary articles uh, that i am uh, that i have picked up this is from the institute of mathematical statistics usa because he was a fellow of that uh, institute uh, there was an obituary article on him and this is what was written that it is believed that the most important factor in this sudden spurt in the study of designs and related areas in the 60s and 70s was the sensational result due to both shrikhande and parker on the falsity of a conjecture by euler on the existence of what are called orthogonal mutually orthogonal latin squares so this is what that article quotes and uh, just to remind you that this conjecture was believed to be to be true for about 176 years and then uh, both shrikhande and they were joined by parker later uh, who proved that this is actually false so you know meaning uh, it takes courage to work on something which is widely widely believed in the community to be true and then you work towards proving that it is false that is that takes a lot of courage so the unexpected result created such an excitement that photos of these mathematicians and their discovery found a prominent place on the front page of the new york times and it attracted a large number of young mathematicians into this area so he the author here is explained why there was a sudden spurt in the study of designs and related areas in the 90s 60s and 70s so this is uh, what uh, professor shrikhande has achieved had achieved when he went to usa so the work of this great researcher not only had high aesthetic beauty but they also proved to be very useful in diverse applications so it's not that you know his technique proved something and then that was the end of the technique the technique was in fact used in many other areas which were uh, scarcely related to that particular problem that euler had stated so let me tell you something about uh, euler because uh, this is where the whole thing begins and i should give you some idea on uh, who euler really is meaning uh, the greatness of euler should be told to you before we tell you how professor shrikhande with his co-authors disproved one of his conjectures so this is uh, leonard euler and uh, he was a swiss mathematician he uh, was born in the place called basel in switzerland so he was a swiss mathematician but he was not just that he was a physicist an astronomer a geographer a logician and engineer but that's not where it ends he founded the studies of graph theory and topology so these are two areas which are very popular areas these days in mathematics topology is something you know it's supposed to be one of the main frontier areas in iit bombay when people take admission for phd programs we teach them some of the basic courses there are the courses in algebra analysis topology in addition to courses in combinatorics and differential equations and statistics so topology is supposed to be one of the basic area and graph theory is something that we most of the uh, mathematics people know about graph theory it's such a basic area these days that everybody knows about it and euler was the one who began the study of graph theory if you are very curious about it you can search for what is called konigsberg konigsberg bridge problem euler 
it's okay if you don't get the spelling of Königsberg correct because bridge problem and Euler will take care that Google will find the right search for you. So this was Euler, but I haven't put a full stop. So the sentence is still continuing. And not just that he founded these studies, but Euler made numerous discoveries in many other branches of mathematics, meaning I did not include all of them here. But he made contributions to analytical number theory. He made contributions to numerical analysis, to differential equations. You name an area and you will see that Euler's name is associated to that area. And he did not just make research contributions in these areas. He also made the subject neat. He introduced some very important notations. In fact, the notation of a mathematical function, the F round bracket X, and then we complete the round bracket which we take for granted these days, that was introduced by Euler. In fact, Euler is the one who introduced the symbol pi for the number it stands for. He is the one who introduced that symbol E. And that is today, actually, it is called Euler's number, the number E, 2.78128 dot, dot, dot. So Euler is responsible for not just contributing highly in mathematical research, but also giving a nice shape to mathematics overall. And these are some of the other things. He was known for his work in mechanics, fluid dynamics, optics, astronomy, and music theory. So wherever there could be some applications of mathematics, Euler would be there, and he would have uh, applied mathematics and solved problems. He is one of the greatest mathematicians in history, and this he is actually the greatest of the 18th century. So if you have studied something about history of mathematics, you would know that there are some great names of mathematicians from 18th century, but Euler ranks at the top of them. So Laplace, for instance, he said once that read Euler, read Euler, he is the master of us all. This is what Laplace said, and the prince of mathematics, Carl Friedrich Gauss, he had remarked that the study of Euler's works will remain the best school for the different fields of mathematics and nothing else can replace it. So this is the Euler that uh, we are discussing about. Not just that he did all this, he was also a prolific writer. There are many people who prove many results, but they are sometimes slow on writing. But Euler was widely considered to be the most prolific, meaning I don't know if you can even guess the number of research papers he wrote. He wrote 850 research papers. And they were all collected. And there are 92 volumes of Euler's collected works. If we have to write 850 pages in our lifetime, imagine how long it will take for us. It was believed that uh, when Euler was working, he wrote on an average one paper per week. This is how he worked and uh, this is how he did his research. Okay, so now we come to the Euler's conjecture, which is related to Shrikhande's work. So um, I will not ask if there are any questions because we haven't really started the uh, interesting things yet. The thing starts now. So before I begin the discussion on this, I should tell you that I was uh, benefited greatly by this article by Professor Sane, one of my past colleagues here in IIT Bombay. He wrote two nice articles in resonance, and in especially the uh, second article uh, in February 2021 issue, which discussed the work of Bose, Parker, and Srikhande. I will follow this article roughly. So this is the article, that photo is of Professor Sane. Uh, let me now start by explaining this uh, conjecture to you. So I think IPL is something which is very popular and today there might be the first match for people uh, who follow IPL. So suppose there are N different IPL teams. So until last year there were eight teams and this year there are 10 teams. So you know we can assume that there are N different IPL teams and also assume that each team has N members. So you, of course, uh, nobody needs to be told that N is a natural number. There are N different IPL teams and each team has N members. 
what we want to do is to have an n by n grid so that each column and each row has only one member for from any given iplt this is what we want to do so all these n square players we have n different iplt teams and each team has n members so there are n square players in all we want to put them all meaning we will not put the players we will put their names we want to put their names in an n by n grid by writing their names but the condition is that if you put name of a player in a particular square or a particular slot then in that column and in that row no other player from the same team should come this is the condition okay so it looks like a nice game it looks like a nice puzzle to do it let's see how we could have done so for instance here i have taken some example if you are looking at the blue names we see that the first row first column has rohit sharma second row second column has bumra third row third column has ishan kishan and fourth row fourth column has surya kumar yadav so these are all players coming from mumbai indians then there is virat kohli second row uh, first row second column second row first uh, column there is maxwell third row fourth column we have mohammad siraj and last row third column we have harshal patel so these are the rcb members similarly there are four delhi capital members pant rishabh pant then prithvi shaw shardul thakur remember shardul thakur moved from csk to delhi now and akshar patel okay and then we have the anti diagonal where uh, you know i cannot miss dhoni so we have dhoni jadeja ruturaj and uthappa i am sorry for not put, putting their names in yellow because it was not very nicely readable so i had to put them in black i have tried to you know maintain the colors as much as possible so this is the way we have done in fact we took the four players and we have four ipl teams each team has only four members and we have put them in a 4x4 uh, grid with the uh, property that each column and each row has only one member per, per, per team so in each row all four teams are represented in each column all four teams are represented that's what we want actually it's not a very difficult problem because what we are really asking you know we let's translate it into mathematical problem what we are asking is that we want to construct an n by n array of numbers from 1 to n these are the teams i told you that each column has to be represent each column represents each team so there each team has to be represented in each column and each row right so if you just call the teams 1 2 3 4 up to n that's making the problem abstract instead of keeping mumbai indians rcb uh, dc and csk instead of putting it some explicit names we call them 1 2 3 4 up to n we are making the problem abstract okay so we have these n teams and what we want is that each row and each column is a permutation of this set 1 2 3 up to n that's all that we are asking for and this is something that can be easily achieved there is, i can actually write down a way to do it so this arrangement can be easily constructed for instance what you do is that you write 1 2 3 up to n in the top row then when you write in the second row you move them all one place forward so it will start one will come in the second column 2 3 so on up to n minus 1 and the n which is now last you put it back in the first column so your first uh, row will read as 1 2 3 4 if we were sticking to our example second row will read as 4 1 2 3 third row will read as, read as 3 4 1 2 and then you will have 2 3 4 1 that's how it will read this is what we have so this can be easily done and this has a name this is called a latin square don't ask me why suddenly the latin thing has come in this but uh, that's the name this is called a latin square okay so these are the things which can be easily arranged so we consider a slightly more difficult problem all right i hope that you have understood the first problem first problem says that you have 1 2 3 up to n and you are writing 
each one two three four should come in each row it should come in each column and each row and each column should not have anything uh, uh, any number should not come twice i think maybe i am stating some conditions extra if all 1 2 3 4 come in all the rows and all the columns then the second condition is already automatically satisfied if you solve sudokus then you know this is something that you always try to do there is one more condition for sudoku that the smaller 3 by 3 uh, squares also have all 1 2 3 up to 9 but definitely all the rows and all the columns have 1 2 3 up to 9 so sudokus are some special types of 9 by 9 latin squares okay so now we go to a slightly more difficult problem what we do is that earlier we had n different ipl teams and there were n players from each team so we had n square players we keep it same that set is same but we assume one more thing for the set which is that these n square players come from n different cities so some some of these players will come from mumbai some will come from bengaluru some from kolkata some from chennai some from tiruvananthapuram some from kashmir say some from uh, lucknow prayagraj kanpur anything and moreover each city will contribute to n players what do we have let me repeat we have n teams each team has n players we have that these players come from n cities and each city also gives n players so each team has exactly one member from each city and each city is giving n players one by one to all these n teams this is what we are assuming okay and now what we want to do is uh yeah so we want to arrange so this is what i said you know we are assuming a more difficult problem in addition to the previous stipulation what was the previous stipulation we wanted to put them all in the n by n grid this is what we wanted to do so now what this translates mathematically is that there are two latin squares now earlier we had the rohit virat uh, pant and dhoni and so on we had one latin square 4 by 4 square this will now require two latin squares l equal to lij and m equal to mij of the same order n so you have n by n latin squares two of them which when superposed when you put one on the other they have the property that all the n square ordered pairs lij to mij so obtained should be different so if we are looking at 1 2 3 4 if your n is 4 then we will look at the uh, set 1 2 3 4 and we take the cross product of this set with itself so it will be like 1 1 1 2 1 3 1 4 2 1 2 2 2 3 2 so on up to 4 4 there will be total 16 elements we want to arrange these 16 elements in a set n by n grid so that whenever you take a column all the first components all need to be different and when the second components they also need to be different similarly whenever you take the first, any row all the first components in the row elements of the row should be all distinct and the second components of the elements in the row they should also be distinct and this should give you total n square different elements you cannot simply have 1 1 1 2 2 3 3 4 4 5 5 and so on up to nn and use our earlier trick that you know you push one by one step right and then put the nn there that's not allowed because the total number of n square elements that should also be distinct okay so let's see whether we can solve it for the 4 by 4 case we have 1 2 3 4 2 1 4 3 3 4 1 2 4 3 2 1 this is l the m is 1 2 4 3 3 4 2 1 2 1 3 4 and 4 3 1 2 1 and now i am going to superpose these on each other so i have l cross m and now we see that all 16 elements are different so you have 1 1 2 2 3 3 4 4 there is a 2 1 here 
um, there is a two two is already there. So maybe if I start from one one, then one two is here, one three is here, one four is here, and four one, four two, four three, four four. So all of them are there. You see that quite easily, right? So we have this total sixteen ordered pairs from the set four cross four is represented here. All of them. Okay, so this is the problem. We would like to do this for every n. The problem is whether this is possible for every n. And this was the problem. This so such a pair. This is a Latin square. Okay, and uh, when we have the property that when you put them on each other and you get different n square elements, ordered pairs, then they are called mutually orthogonal Latin squares. These Latin squares are mutually orthogonal. so uh, when euler uh, euler actually spent quite a lot of his time in st petersburg and uh, so he was actually the uh, guest of the king there and uh, he did his mathematics there so a problem was circulating in st petersburg in the late 1700 and catherine the great the queen asked euler to solve it So I told you that uh, there is the Königsberg bridge problem, which Euler had solved, and Euler had become famous because of that. And uh, you know, meaning the, to tell you very briefly, the problem of Königsberg bridges is to find a way so that you can go over all the bridges. You don't repeat the bridge, and you return where you start from. There is a particular arrangement of all those bridges. and the problem is to return where you came from and go through all the bridges only once all bridges should be gone through and no bridge can be used more than once that was the problem euler proved that it is not possible to prove that something is possible suppose you know if i have to go from mumbai to bengaluru in a certain way suppose i have to go first by bicycle then walk and then run and something if i have to show that this is possible i simply have to do it once and that would prove that it is possible but to show that something is not possible is typically a very difficult thing and euler in fact proved that the königsberg bridge problem cannot be solved and that made him very famous that is that was the beginning of graph theory and topology and so uh, catherine the great again uh, trusted euler to solve this problem so what is the problem the problem is known as 36 officers problem so it was introduced by euler himself in one of one of his articles this is the uh, problem so he says a very curious question which has exercised for some time the ingenuity of many people has involved me in the following studies which seem to open a new field of analysis in particular the study of combinations so you know one may say that say that this is the beginning of combinatorial mathematics also but i think the combinatorics was studied before euler's time as well the question revolves around arranging 36 officers to be drawn from six different regiments so that they are arranged arranged meaning arranged in a square so that in each line whether you take a horizontal line or a vertical line there are six officers of different ranks and different regiments so you have officers coming from different regiments you know in i think in indian military there are different regiments there is a gorkha regiment and there might be some more regiments so there are these regiments and in each regiment there are officers at various levels so there are those ranks so you had six regiments and you are taking per regiment six officers for belonging to six different ranks so you have 36 officers in a um, um, in the set you want to arrange them such that each line and each uh, column each row and each column has six officers of different ranks and different regiments so forget about officers what you are really organizing organizing are the ranks and regiments so you should get this 36 possibilities of rank cross regiment in that 6 by 6 grid that was asked that was this is how euler put this problem across euler could not solve this problem so that was a very uh, surprising thing that he was not able to solve it one way or other 
he was not able to give such an arrangement and he was not able to show that it's not possible but he trusted that it's not possible and then what he did is what typically mathematicians would do that if you are not able to solve a particular problem you tweak the problem a little and see whether you can solve that tweak problem <coughs> so he considered instead of 36 he considered it for n square and euler could actually solve it for all odd n and also the ends which were a multiple of 4 we solved the problem for n equal to 4 there is a solution for all multiples of 4 and euler actually proved that there is a solution for all odd n he has a very nice method using you know prime factorization of n and so on because you have to look at that n square uh, arrangement and you can write each row if you have prime factors you can consider uh, smaller squares of that particular type so uh, that's what uh, was the way euler also worked in number theory so he had uh, several techniques at his disposal from number theory and he could apply them and prove that such an arrangement was possible whenever you had an odd number n and whenever n was a multiple of 4 so what was now left were the numbers which were called oddly even so these are the numbers which left 2 as the remainder when you divided by 4 you know the num problem is solved for all odd n so the only numbers which are left are the even numbers so you will look at 2 4 6 8 10 12 and so on each alternate number is a multiple of 4 so for them also this problem is solved so the problem is now meaning that time it was open for numbers which were even but they were not multiples of 4 that would mean that when you divide such a number by 4 you get 2 as the remainder okay so these are the numbers of the type 4m plus 2 and the problem that was asked to euler was for 6 which is one such number so this starts from 2 then 6 then 10 14 18 22 and so on that's how the problem goes what about 2 meaning you know the problem is asked for 6 but what about 2 can we think what would happen for 2 so in fact euler's conjecture is true for n equal to 2 and he observed it meaning this is not something that people observed later he observed it himself let's try to prove it so suppose we want to construct such a grid what we have is that we have 1 2 cross 1 2 so we have four numbers we have four ordered pairs 1 1 1 2 2 1 and 2 2 okay we have these four ordered pairs at our hand we want to arrange them in the 2 by 2 grid that's what we want to do so what we start doing is that we take elements from this set this set has four different elements and we want to put them in the 2 by 2 grid and you know suppose we start with 1 1 you can start with any number but you know by permutation you can make it 1 1 so we start with 1 1 now the second element in the same row has to be 2 2 because when you look at the row and you look at the first components then they those two will have to be distinct so once you have one as the first component taken already two has to be taken and similarly one as the second component has been taken then the second component has to be two so 1 1 is done 2 2 is done now you can use elements only from here 1 2 and 2 1 which element do you put here if you put 1 2 then 1 is repeated in the first column if you put 2 1 then 1 is repeated in the second column so the um, orthogonal this arrangement is not possible for n equal to 2 so we cannot solve it for n equal to 2 okay that's what actually led euler to believe that uh, since he could not uh, he he proved that it is not possible for n equal to 2 and he could not solve it for n equal to 6 yet he could solve for numbers which were odd and multiples of 4 that led him believe that uh, such a grid such grids will not exist whenever your number is of the type 4m plus 2 so indeed the n equal to 6 was proved so remember that the conjecture was made in 1782 
and in 1901 a french mathematician gaston uh, terry he proved that n equal to 6 was indeed impossible <clears throat> but his proof was not mathematical what he did was that he checked all possible cases huge number of cases and he laboriously checked all of them you know for instance the n equal to 2 we just tried to write write it down and we reached a block so we could not continue after uh, writing the first row and therefore it will not be possible for n equal to 2 so he got all all possible starting points and then he proved that in each starting point you will hit a block there will be a, a time when you cannot proceed and complete the grid this was proved for n equal to 6 in 1901 and then in 1959 Uh, both parker and srikhande proved the uh, general result so until 1959 this was open and uh, what happened was that parker was working on something called pairwise balanced designs and both and srikhande from you know the insights they received from their own research they both believed that euler's conjecture is not true they wanted to prove that it is false they wanted to show that the grids existed from 10 onwards that's what they felt and so they wanted to work on that i told you that srikhande after completing his phd came to nagpur and then in 1959 he went back to work with bose and their plan was to work on euler's conjecture it's not something that they got accidentally they had planned to solve this they had planned to disprove euler so they constructed counter examples of order 22 so not for n equal to 10 14 or 18 for uh, n equal to 22 they uh, gave the grid or two mutually orthogonal latin squares for order 22 so 22 by 22 484 uh, squares in all and parker you know they used parker's work so parker noticed their work and he started to believe that he should be able to do it for smaller numbers he was working with military at that time and he had military computer at his disposal so just as a fun uh, thing he did a computer search and he uh, using a one hour computer search he found that there is a counter example of order 10 so he could get a 10 by 10 grid containing uh, two mutually orthogonal latin squares uh, which disproved euler so it was both and srikhande's work which was not done using computer it was a pure mathematical result it was done by pure insight uh, mathematical insight and mathematical reasoning after that parker uh, found this example of order 10 and since anyway both and srikhande had used parker's work they all collaborated so the one of the articles which i read on srikhande it says that this this was followed Uh, by a feverish correspondence between all these three mathematicians and ultimately it culminated in the final disproof of euler's conjecture um, for all n bigger than or equal to 10 so euler's conjecture is not true for 2 it's not true for meaning euler's conjecture holds for n equal to 2 it holds for n equal to 6 but beyond that it doesn't hold which means that mutually orthogonal latin squares exist for all orders n bigger than 1 except for n equal to 2 and 6 okay of course there are many more questions in this how many such pairs can you find that is a question and that question has not been answered even today so that question is still open if people want to work in this area this is a difficult question of course because uh, several people have worked on it and they haven't solved it completely but who knows you might bring in some new techniques and you might be able to solve this so this is there is still scope for a lot of interesting work to be done okay so uh, i cannot give the proof uh, in detail in fact i don't even understand the proof completely the proof had ideas from geometry combinatorics and also statistics and uh, bose when he talked about his work later he said it's a striking example of the unity of science the initial impulse which leads to a solution of the problem propounded by euler came from the practical needs of agricultural experimentation you know this is a very curious term 
that this problem was motivated by the agricultural experimentation so you know i don't know how much time i have but uh, maybe i could just spend one minute on explaining what how this problem came up yeah so you can yeah thank you so you know in agriculture there are fertilizers which are used and uh, companies wanted to experiment with several fertilizers and uh, you know in nature you cannot say that these are all the parameters you know even for corona there are various models which are made and we see that all the predictions go haywire the corona is still ranging on that's because we are not sure what are all the parameters whether we have considered all possible parameters so in nature it is never clear uh, where you what you are working with and whether you are considering all the parameters so this agricultural experimentation was a very simple experiment it was uh, an experiment of uh, taking some particular fertilizers and trying it out on some particular plants so what they did was that there were some three fertilizers and there were three plants and they wanted to have these 9 by 9 grid so that in each the three fertilizers will be used on uh, these plants separately so fertilizer cross plant because there are three fertilizers three different fertilizers there are three different plants you have a total set of nine ordered pairs and you don't want to keep them in the same row because you know uh, the wind may blow one fertilizer from one tree to another tree and that will uh, give you uh, the results which are not the correct results so the uh, agriculturists they wanted to put these trees not in the same row not in the same column but apart from each other so that it was a huge field and in that field they planted these trees in the square formation with the condition that each row and each column did not have the same tree twice and each row and each column was did not have the same fertilizer being used twice that was the condition and whether you can do it for all that was the question which was then uh, brought to euler's notice and this is how it all started so this problem came from very practical needs of agricultural experimentation and uh, it river uh, what it did was that it gave the knowledge to basic combinatorics so the um, usual passage is that you study something basic and then you apply it in the uh, real situation but here is something which came from real situation and it gave uh, as an application uh, some contribution to basic mathematics and of course now this is the thing about the new york times uh, article which i alluded to very briefly in the beginning so both record what happened the day after the result was announced at a meeting of american mathematical society so the science editor of the new york times came to interview us this is what he said and next morning our picture appeared on the first page of the sunday edition of the new york times with a description of our work so people were excited because euler's conjecture which stood open for 176 years that was being proved to be false by these mathematicians so there was lot of attention to this and professor bose was staying in a small hotel at that time next morning when he went to pay the bill the cashier looked at him and asked him is that your picture in the new york times that's what the cashier asked him because you know it would be very clear it's a picture of some guy typically a black guy because you know indians are not as fair as the americans and he could recognize the photo easily and both said yes it is my picture then the hotel manager said that you must have done something because the front page of the new york times cannot be bought even for a million dollars this is what the hotel person said that tells us about how great this achievement was so coming back to professor shrikhande he is of course well known for more of his work than this disproof of euler's conjecture in particular Uh, while at the same time when he was investigating these latin squares he published one more paper in the same year on a graph which is now uh, which has now come to be known as uh, shrikhande graph it has connections to algebra group theory topology and uh, very interesting connections as has already been mentioned above 
Shrikhande also took up many administrative duties and diligently continued doing research while performing those duties. So, in fact, uh, people while reminiscing about him would say that, you know, when he was head, not just at Mumbai University, but at various places, he had to do a lot of administrative work and his office would have regular stream of visitors. So, he would nonchalantly return to work as soon as he has disposed of such frequent interruptions. You know, people who are very seriously into mathematics would understand that once you are taken away, once the link is broken, once you are interrupted in your uh, work, it's not easy to come back. It takes a while. But Professor Shrikhande would uh, return immediately to uh, work and continue from where he had left. Uh, one admirable quality of him was uh, that in spite of his great, great achievements, he continued to be kind and courteous and genuinely helpful. I told you about this article that was written on him in the Institute of Mathematical Statistics of uh, the United States. It was written by um, some Firang, I don't remember the name, but that person said that he had met Professor Srikhande in that AMS meeting where the result was presented. And in that meeting, he was impressed that Professor Srikhande was also curious about knowing other things that in design theory than boasting about his own work. It was a great work, but he was also interested in what else is going on. And he said that it was very nice to see that uh, Professor Srikhande was such a humble person. That's all. That, that's what he writes in that article. So in Bhavana, which is a mathematical uh, uh, periodical in India, uh, in October 2017, when Professor Srikhande completed the century, Nityananda Rao wrote about him that Shrikhande had different facets to his personality. He, uh, the young man traveling to distant shores, the loving husband and father, the family man who remained close to his siblings, the mathematician and mentor, the yoga practitioner, and the doting grandfather and great-grandfather. And as Nityananda Rao writes further, all these facets of Professor Sri Khande, they were not orthogonal to each other, but they blended harmoniously. <laughs> Professor Sri Khande completed his uh, century in 2017. He was at Vijayawada then, uh, in a simple but uh, spectacular way. The celebrations were done. He passed away in April 2020. So I think it's a great uh, thing for you know such a great mathematician to have lived for such a long time and had been active all his life. It would be very fitting to celebrate the life he lived and be inspired by this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Shripad. Uh, I would uh, probably ask others to say something if they want to say before I say anything. So uh, we are not many on the meeting. So you can unmute yourself. If you like, you can uh, uh, video chat also. Please, in case you would like to ask Shripad something or you would like to say something about Professor Sri Kande and his work, please uh, do that. So, floor is open. Hello. Please say loudly so that we can hear. Please unmute and. Uh... Yeah, this is uh, Tamba Nair. <laughs> ah, Nair, please. Yeah, yeah, nothing. I'm just want to say that's a good, very good exposition. So just want to say that. That's all. <laughs> ah, nice. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Thamban. Yeah. yeah. Um, anybody else would like to say something? Professor Ajit Iqbal saying? Yes, you see, a wonderful talk. It is inspiring for all. And uh, I would like to point out for people that there are quantum Latin squares, and Jamie Vekari, his student Ben Musto, and David Reuters have discussed them further and other people too. And recently, Carol Zukowski gave a wonderful talk on 36 quantum officers. 
at ISI Kolkata Conference on Quantum Information Theory and Foundation. And all the uh, talks and papers are on archive, freely available to anybody. I just mentioned a few authors, but it has interested many people. And also people in Chennai, Sundar and Vijay Kodialam, they have worked further on work by Jamie Vekari, but that is not on Latin squares, that is on uh, bi-unitaries, planar algebras. But for quantum Latin squares, you can see Vikari, Musto, Reuters, and uh, Zukoski. And there is a lot more. And also myself and uh, uh, Professor Parthasarthi, Subhash Chaturvedi, and Shibashish Ghosh, we have used Latin squares for quantum information theory for quantum tomography. And examples were used by, you know, a long time ago by Schwinger. And we there is a problem with your audio person, Digbal Singh. <laughs> I think so the there issue. is a lot happening from Latin squares, and uh, there is for students' level, there are four put up by American Mathematical Society, and that is of uh, you know. Um, I think uh, there was some internet problem. Uh, anybody else would like to say something? So uh, I think uh, let me uh, thank Sripad for bringing some sweet memories of my, my young age when I interacted with Professor Shrikande um, as a student for MSc and a, as a research scholar. I fully agree he was a very humble person and very helpful. Uh, I won't have hesitation to say that I wouldn't have been uh, whatever I am as a mathematics teacher or a student, if it was not for Shri Kande. Uh, like, uh, I, I came from a very small town, Yamnanagar, where I had done BSc and something, and I came for an interview to Bombay. And somehow, I don't know what Shri Kande saw. He said uh, he should be given admission and a scholarship. So I, because of that only I could do MSc because I was given a scholarship. Otherwise, uh, anyway. So uh, let me uh, uh, thank his general soul for helping me to come where I am today. Um, I, I think uh, his work uh, is very easy to explain as Shiripada has done it. And uh, it has a profound uh, mathematics and statistics in it. So that is really a revelation to me I, I didn't know that, uh, yeah, I knew that he was at Indian Statistical Institute and um, how design of experiments in statistics would have influenced his thinking. That was uh, a, a revelation to me. Thank you, Shripad, for your talk. And uh, thank you coming over and giving a beautiful uh, talk and making everybody understand about uh, works of one of our great mathematicians uh, as as Shri Kande. So with that, uh, I close the session. I just want to say to some of you that uh, next week we have a very interesting uh, session uh, called Mathambola, which is about uh, uh, Tambola played mathematically. So uh, please, uh, if you are uh, connected with some schools or teachers, uh, please do circulate this uh, in your information to your uh, uh, schools and teachers, especially to students, so the mathematics involved is very elementary, but it will help them to understand uh, in a fun way kind of a thing. So it's more of a fun uh, session the next uh, week uh, on 2nd of April. So please do come. Thank you all of you for coming and joining us and uh, making Math Clinic uh, possible. Thank you very much. And take Thank you. Bye.
Bye. Take care, everybody.